Between the 15th and 19th centuries, a vast slave trade was established between Europe, Africa, and America. Approximately 12 million men, women, and children were sold as slaves on the coast of Africa, torn from their homeland, and transported across the Atlantic by white slave traders to work in the New World. This trade grew considerably over a century and a half and resisted several attempts to abolish it. Slavery was officially abolished in France on April 27, 1848. Stories from slaves, captain's logbooks, and letters written by ship owners come together to form the vibrant framework of this story of slavery and bring to life the fates of Yonka and Tariki, born free in a village in the Gulf of Guinea. I couldn't say how many days we worked for. I lost all sense of time. But it was several weeks during which more unfortunate people like us joined us. We had no idea what to expect and could not even begin to imagine what lay ahead. The slave trade, which had been banned in France for seven years, continued in secret between Africa and the Americas. Although slavery had been abolished in France in 1794, Napoleon re-established it. Emboldened by the lax attitude shown by authorities, slave ship owners in Nantes, Bordeaux, and the West Indies continued their lucrative partnership. Ships delivered arms and merchandise from Europe and America in exchange for African slaves sold to the French West Indies and Cuba. These ships would then return to France, loaded with merchandise from the plantations, coffee, sugar, and coca beans. One winter morning in 1825, the brig La Bienfaisant from Nantes set sail towards the Gulf of Guinea. It would take three months for it to reach its destination on the southwest coast of Africa. On the 16th of April, 1825, having reached the coast of Africa 98 days after leaving Nantes, the Bienfaisant dropped anchor at the mouth of a river.
the supply of slaves was under the control of local traffickers who took advantage of tribal wars, famines, and raids to take people captive. Sometimes they allowed the white slave traders to negotiate directly with the local population. These slave traders who came from Europe and America learned how to comply with the lengthy negotiation rituals. After making us wait 12 days, King Peppel finally agreed to an audience. I decided to take the ship's surgeon along with me. For him, it would be an edifying experience as he had never visited these parts before, and I doubt that he had any idea of how negotiations were conducted. I hadn't told him a thing. What do you need, Captain? 300 parrots and mules, half in pieces of Indian cloth. I can only give you between 160 and 200 pieces. Then allow me to trade with the natives. I consider it. We waited many days and nights. With me were women and children from our village and from villages farther away that I didn't know. The men were in separate huts. Some of them had fought back, but others were too weak to put up a fight. It's a beautiful gun, much more beautiful than the last ones. There are 120 Dutch ones like this, and 800 French ones like the last lot. Do you think it would hit the water jug? His Majesty could easily hit it, and even something much smaller. Trading can now begin. I got what I wanted. We can choose the slaves ourselves, and King Peppel has authorized us to trade with the natives. Before setting sail, the crew reorganizes the deck. A wooden fence with a door separates the bridge. Tall nets are tied to the outer rail to stop people falling overboard. The ship's carpenters have halved the height of the lower deck to create another deck on either side of a corridor. The human cargo is stored on two levels. These are my recommendations. 
You are already familiar with them, as we have already worked together in the past, yet as they are crucial to the success of our expedition, I'm not afraid to say them again. Endeavor to choose good specimens and select the younger ones, between the ages of 15 and 35 maximum. Aside from the fact that they are more resistant to exhaustion caused by the long sea crossing, once you are in America, you will get a better price for them. Make sure that you have between a quarter and a third of Indian cloth. At least five foot two inches tall, stocky, are neither lame nor blemished, a full set of teeth, a full head of hair, and in excellent health. Don't be ashamed to lick their skin, to taste their sweat, to check that they haven't contracted any diseases. As for the women, choose them young of childbearing age, or soon to be of that age. But make sure that the women account for no more than a third of the men. As for the Negro children, they must not account for more than one third of the women. Today, I had all our slaves branded with the letters LB, for Le Bion Faison, so that King Peppel cannot swap them for specimens of a lesser value before we have got them on board the ship. I saw when we got to the coast was the sea, of course, but also the ship. I had never seen anything so big on the water, but my surprise soon turned to fear when I realized the ship was waiting for its cargo, and that cargo was us. Although I tried my best not to show it, I was terrified when they made us get on board. I remember what the others were saying, that we were headed for beyond the Great Sea, and that white people would eat us. Take all necessary precautions to avoid the spread of parasites and diseases that Negroes carry, and which are often the cause of loss of life amongst our slaves. To this effect, have them shaved all over, or wash their heads and bodily hair in vinegar. Do not forget to wash their eyes. Lime fruits, which you find easily in that part of the world, are very good for this. For too often, once at their destination, the slaves that have partially or entirely lost their eyesight can no longer be sold. Competition between ships has resulted in an increase in prices. Therefore, we shall only take 286 slaves out of the 300 we initially wanted and the 360 that Le Bion Faison could have held if we reduced the amount of space per slave. These 286 slaves cost the same amount as 360 would have cost two years ago. 3,000 pieces of Indian cloth, and from Nantes, 1,400 guns and swords, 1,500 barrels of gunpowder and bags of lead. 400 pieces of china, 120 cases of glass beads, 10,000 liters of brandy, and 5,000 iron ingots. <laughs> Deep inside the hall, it was impossible to move and impossible to sleep. We were separated from the men. That first night, I kept my eyes wide open. I wanted to wake up back in our village, seeing my mother's face.
Today, the 1st of September, we cast off and set sail after 137 days at anchor. We're missing 14 pieces, but I don't want to wait any longer. How did she get a hold of this piece of cloth without anyone noticing? As I held them all responsible for the death of that Negro woman, I ordered each sailor to be given 20 lashes on the rear deck. I also told them to be more vigilant from now on. Clearly, death is less frightening for these damn Negroes than the journey towards a future they know nothing about. To avoid the outbreak of a rebellion, they would take us up on the deck in small numbers, men and women separately. There, we were fed and washed. We could stretch our limbs, breathe fresh air, and see each other in natural light, and we could look out at the sea. Go on, make them sing and dance. Mind that you make our Negroes sing and dance as often as is possible, at least twice a week. Music and dancing are so important to them that without these, they may voluntarily slip into a state of affliction that often leads to death. We were scared of getting ill. We had stomach cramps, diarrhea, burning fevers, and then cold shivers. Some of us died, some of the white people too. We never knew what they did with the bodies. Wait, are you planning on doing an autopsy on him? It might be useful to know what he died of in case any other Negroes catch the same It illness. was dysentery. Don't open him up for that. Let me show you something. Several of my colleagues agree that Negro inferiority is due to the specific anatomical structure of this part of the brain known as the corpus callosum, which is smaller in size than ours. Many of the Negroes think they are going to be eaten. If they find out one of them has been cut open, it'll only encourage them to think they were right to be scared. So put this away now. I don't intend to have to quash a rebellion with Negroes taking control of the ship because they're afraid they might end up in the butcher's block.
aduna chidunya the stink down in the hole was unbearable. The cramped space, the heat, and the fact that there were so many of us meant that we all sweated profusely. Added to this was the filthy states of the latrines. The air was so putrid, it made it hard to breathe. The confined space in which the captives are held and the need to keep them chained and shackled contribute to the proliferation of harmful microorganisms that cause disease. Death can be prevented by bringing the Negroes up on deck to air them and wash them down in seawater. Be sure to log every Negro death, and mind that you throw any dead bodies overboard at night to prevent this sorry spectacle from awakening feelings of rebellion among the other Negroes. Be sure to wash down the space the dead Negro occupied, and scrub it with strong vinegar as all sorts of diseases can come out of their bodies and spread. And of all human bodies, the bodies of Negroes are of the kind that manifest these sorts of infections most often. Cleanliness is a task that must be repeated tirelessly. The health of your crew depends on it. Sixteenth of October, 1825. Le Bienfaisant has the French West Indies in its sights. The brig had a good crossing, much faster than we ever could have hoped for. 46 days from the coast of Africa. That's 18 days less than the fastest journey I have done to this day. Our speed spared us the loss of life that a longer journey would probably have caused. Out of the 286 slaves that we embarked with, only 16 were lost. Six Negro men, five Negro women, three Negro girls, and two Negro boys, representing a 6% loss in takings. Meanwhile, out of the 32 crew members, we lost four sailors and the ship's boy. In the last three months, the governor has had two ships seized before they had time to offload their Negroes. It's not that the governor has got it into his head to enforce the law banning the slave trade, nor is he a newfound liking for Negroes, but he is currently building new roads, bridges, and churches, so he has been requisitioning the Negroes from slave ships and making them work for him.
Luckily, I have found three colonists who I trust and who desperately need more Negroes. We will make it look like your Negroes are already old property belonging to these colonists, and that the sale will take place in their names. Officially, you will just be acting as their representative. I have all the documents needed should there be a control check. The local police and the customs officers are quite easygoing, but there's a new young magistrate who recently arrived from France. He was on the same boat as me. He's everywhere, asking lots of questions to colonists and slaves. It's better to have everything in order, just in case he starts poking his nose into our business on the day of the sale. Benga Chasso, Benga Feodi. Legging at Amgen, I need you best. You walk along noon. Keep Pukufi the flow out yon, Dunla de Dara. Why keep Pukufi wa? Walang nga hall si tuba, but buo ka warta hall, di nang dal si sakaw. Tariki and I wanted to have the same master. We wanted to pretend to be man and wife, but I didn't dare go over to him, and neither did he. He stayed where he was. We sold 270 slaves, of which 136 were divided into 18 lots of three to six members. 12 families of three to four members and 88 pieces of Indian cloth sold individually. As there were several takers from some lots, I gave preference to those who could pay outright, whether payment was in merchandise or money. The two families who didn't find any takers were broken up. Then the Negro boys and girls were sold separately. 
However, for those families who procured a lot of interest, they were auctioned and we got much more for them than for many other lots. Look at these muscles. This mule is sure to be hardworking. 180. Bidding starts at 180. 200, sir. 200. 230. I have 230. I have 300. 350. Come on, don't let such a fine specimen get away. 950. Yes, sir. 1,000. 1,100. Any higher? 1,100. Sold to Mr. Bonifond. Now we have an outstanding parrot. I shall start bidding at 150. 180. I have 180. 220. 250. 280. 300. We have 300. 300. 330. Look at these breasts. Look at these breasts. And this belly, which has not been spoiled by pregnancy. These buttocks, so firm and muscular. 350. I have 350. 400. Over here. 400. Who will give me any higher? Sold to Mr. Dishart for 400. Our third item is another exceptional specimen. Very good, his uncle. His torso. I admit, I wanted her. Look at his shoulders. When we got to the dwelling, or as they called it, the master's property, a priest made a speech telling us how lucky we were. Thanks to the white people who brought us here, we would enter the family of God and our souls would be saved. Although we had our own gods, he explained that here there was only one God, and if we didn't live in his love, we would burn in hell for all eternity. I will put my spirit in you, and you will follow my laws. You will obey my commandments, and you will be faithful to me. Step forward. Your name is Sikrist. And then they gave us new names. Uleli. No one asked us our real names. Your name is Uzeb. They acted like we didn't have names. They just told me my name was Delhi. Your name is Delhi. From that day on, I was never called anything else. You were Jean Baptiste. Later on, I learned that Toriki had been renamed St. John. Your elders will teach you the running of the estate. If you obey, if you work hard, you will be treated well. However, any act of insubordination, any attempt at rebellion or trying to escape will be severely punished in accordance with what's been set out by the law. Any slave who strikes his master or his master's wife or their children, and this act results in bruising or drawing blood, will be sentenced to death. And if you try to escape, you will be punished. For a first attempt, the fugitive will be branded on the shoulder with a fleur de lis. For a second, the fugitive will have their shin flayed. For a third attempt, the fugitive will be sentenced to death. The commander wings the bear at sunrise. But when the days are short, we must wake in the dark. This is followed by mass, as they call it, a sort of prayer for their God. And then we go to walk.
we each have a patch of land. You can grow what you like on it, and what you reap is yours. You can eat it or sell it, but you can only tend to your patch on Saturdays. They call it Saturday Garden. When you sell something, keep the money, it's yours. But never leave it in the heart. There are dishonest Negroes who steal money. Some women buy back their freedom with their bodies. But not here, because this one, he has a wife. But his nephew's place is different takes one of the new ones into his bed. And sometimes, if she's clever, he falls in love with her and gives her back her freedom. But not always, because the master's nephew sleeps with all the new ones, but never gives them their freedom. You can buy your own body back, which means buying your freedom. But the majority of Negroes who walk in this cursed country die walking before they have been able to save enough money. It takes so many years to save up that you're old and useless by the time you have enough. And what can you do once you're free? You wander the streets without any work, with no money to eat or sleep. You will see freed slaves when you go into town. You will see poor Negroes who look like old wrecks. And you will see a few Negroes who managed to earn a bit of money because they've served the white folks so well that they were given bonuses. But they too have become white folks in their minds. Without question, it has been poisoned. It's dying. This could only have been caused by poison. What poison? I don't know. But it's definitely poison. Mm. Mm. Today we lost an ox. Along with the animals we lost last week, that makes three ox and two mules. There are poisoners amongst you. This crime is punishable by death. If any one of you knows who's guilty, come forward at once, or you'll be charged with collusion. I hold you all responsible. You will pay for the dead livestock by working Saturdays and Sundays for the next month. If you're not happy, then hand over the guilty. I'll lift the sanction. In the meantime, go back to your huts immediately. No introduction necessary, Mr. Dustall. People speak of you so often, I knew you'd turn up soon. They speak of you also, Mr. Desart.
My wife. Welcome. Madame? In France, people like you have made assumptions, knowing nothing about the real situation in the colonies. You have just arrived. But once you've spent some time here, you will understand the need to preserve the established order through slavery. There are no workers who want to come from France. Even if there were, they would never survive the climate of this godforsaken country. Only Negroes, used to the heat of the tropics, can work here. Yet this race we must command are fiendish and treacherous. They're serpents. Isn't that a little excessive? Negroes and people of color have one thing in mind, and it makes me shudder. To destroy the whites. Pierre? I hope we'll find our daughter a good husband, so she may contribute to a race of honest people while we continue to diminish the race of rogues. That is my mission too, Mr. Desart. <laughs> You know, I've often secretly watched their revelries. You can't imagine how utterly indecent the movements of the two dancers can be. Do you see all the mulattoes? They're almost all the offspring of married settlers. Men who would never shake the hand of a Negro man won't think twice about betting a Negro woman by force to satisfy their desires. I found out where Toriki was by questioning the other slaves. He did the same and came to find me several times at night. This went on for a few weeks until the day two slaves died from those so-called poisonings and Pierre Desart forbid us from receiving any visitors. It was at that moment that we decided to run away, to be marooned, as people called them. I can't tolerate that some of you tried to escape. All of you know what happens when you try to run away. But the government has asked us to stop the mutilations. So Saint-Jean and Delis will not have their ears cut off. But... the law requires that they be punished. to walk again the next morning, but for the next 30 nights, I was forced to sleep in a hole with my feet shackled. Before locking me away, the steward rubbed my wounds with a mixture of lemon and chili pepper. Supposedly, it was to prevent infection, but in reality, it was an added torture. Thinking back to that moment, I would have preferred to have died from gangrene rather than go through that. As for Tariki, he spent three days tied to a stake with no food or water. After that, his master, Pierre Desart's nephew, came to get him. 
Tariki could no longer walk. He had to be carried in a cart. Pierre Desart isn't the worst. He's very severe and brutally punishes his slaves when he thinks they've done wrong. But he calls the doctor if a slave is sick. Has their children looked after by servants while the parents work? And doesn't force pregnant women to work? But there aren't many pregnant slaves. Only two babies have been born here this year. Most women prefer to make their bellies bleed rather than give birth to a slave child. Bonifon, Pierre Desard's nephew, is hard and cruel. The women there work until their water breaks and are sent back to work the next day. Tariki told me that he whips everyone, even children. And he has beaten slaves to death. I have to go now, before the market ends. Hmm. Leave your yarn. You've been gone long enough as it is. You know, some of the slaves have learned to read. So they know the law. A master may beat his slaves, but he doesn't have the right to kill them. A man like Bonifon deserves to be in prison for what he does to his slaves. I don't have the same power as the police here. I can only ask, but I promise I will. Sniff around wherever you like. I couldn't care less. I have nothing to hide. No one has anything to hide. Yet every day the governor receives a letter requesting I be sent back to France on the next boat. Where would you like to start? Wherever you please. No. I've always been well treated and well fed. I work. Yes, but I can rest whenever I need to. You've never been beaten. Never. What are you afraid of? Of being beaten if you speak out? In your country, do you expect to touch the hearts of the people in those faraway lands? Do you expect them to mix their tears with the tears of the poor black people? Tell me, will the slave be seated on a golden throne? Will that make him any less of a slave? Would that make him any less the property of another man? I 
I've already said too much. I saw a plantation owner take an iron trunk, lock the poor victim of his tyranny inside it, and place it near the heat of the fire to cause excruciating pain. A young man told me that in order to be able to recognize his slaves, he had the ears of six slaves cut off. I watched a Negro woman who had stolen a duck be given 50 lashings, then have her wounds rubbed with lemon and chili. She was tied up outside and left for two weeks to pay for the terrible crime that she pleaded guilty to. I saw... I'll stop there. I'm tired of describing these atrocities. When you get back to France, be very careful that your servant only writes when you are present. These scoundrels use every trick there is to send messages back here, telling other Negroes about equality and freedom. Some even send messages to the colonies demanding the abolition of slavery. Ah. Speak of the devil, and lo, he appears. I think he's pleased we finally decided to send him back. I wish you a pleasant journey. Raw and refined sugar, coffee, cocoa beans, indigo, cotton, pepper, rum, mahogany. The hold and lower decks of Le Bienfaisant are loaded with goods which, as well as money, was used to pay for slaves. At my master's nephew's estate, they found the corpses of other dead livestock. <laughs> Bonifan accused Toriki and two other slaves, Yusef and Solitude, who was pregnant, of poisoning the livestock. <laughs> My female elder knew that Bonifan wanted to punish Toriki for speaking to the magistrate who had recently left the island. The judges sentenced all three of them to death. They waited for Solitude to give birth before hanging her. I asked to speak to my master, Pierre de Sade. I swore the evidence was faked and Toriki was innocent. He refused to intervene. Later, I begged him to buy Solitude's child. He agreed and freed the child, naming him Agricole.
Normally, baptized slaves, like Tariki, were supposed to be buried in a cemetery. But they refused. I searched for a long time, but never found him. Yeah. 